And so the format for tonight will be a brief introduction by uh, Jen and Tim, a little <coughs> topic, uh, a little conversational starter, and um, and then we'll do some Q and A followed by open Q and A uh, discussion. Great, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Um, it's awesome to be here. Um, appreciate the the background. I thought maybe I will start actually with finer point on sort of um, the role of the brigade. So um, I think it makes actually makes some sense. We spent a lot of time in the past month talking about our vision statement for Code of America, and I think it really speaks to the um, what we mean, why we come together. What we kind of continually go back to is sort of the guiding star here at Code of America is this. We believe that government can work stop there, and that's a pretty radical <laughs> statement sometimes. We believe that government can work for the people, by the people, in the 21st century, if we make it so. And there's two really important places where an event like this, a night like this, a, a community like this come into play there, which is by the people. Um, by the people means a lot of different things. Um, when we first started the organization, we were just a fellowship program in the beginning go into that, but I think a lot of you guys know about the fellowship program and how it works. But the fellows, you know, were sort of an, an example of by the people men. It's like, let's bring people who aren't in government into the space and let them do something. And then the sort of second iteration of that was, okay, and it turns out that they're going to create applications that allow us to be involved in some way that's not the way we kind of grew up thinking we should be involved in government, which is let's go to government and tell them what we want. Let's say, this isn't working, let's complain. Let's advocate for our needs. But instead say, we don't have to just complain. We can actually help fix the problem. And sometimes we call that, let's offer our hands, not just our voices. Sometimes we say, by the people. Um, but it's been expressed in a lot of different ways. Uh, but when we realized that there was a much larger community of people beyond just you know, the number of fellows that we could bring into partner if we even wanted to do this, we said, okay, wait, let's, let, it wasn't us initially organizing anything, it was just sort of putting uh, a, 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 a label or an umbrella across what was already happening here and in Oakland and in other places around the country and saying, this is by the people. Um, then we we're really getting to that last line of statement, which is, government is only going to work if we make it so. And we does not mean code for America. It doesn't even mean just the brigades. It means everybody has to take responsibility for that. But when you see people getting together every week at uh, Hack Night in San Francisco or in Oakland or in uh, um, Virginia Beach, Virginia, or in um, Portsmouth or in you know any of the places. Where, how many are we up to, Hannah? We have about 120 um, in various stages of getting together around the world. But, but San Francisco is, is special. Special. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You're right about that. Uh, then you start to go, oh, that's not just, those aren't just words, right? That's not just something that is kind of hacked around, you know, it's sort of derived from founding fathers, it's derived from sort of these. So this is actually true. You know, the first yeah. volunteer fire brigade in America was organized by Ben Franklin. So, I mean, literally, the brigade concept is really from the book founding fathers. And you, by the way, sitting in the Ben Franklin room of Founding Fathers, so that's what we call this room. But then you really start to see that um, that statement is literally true. It, it, is go, it is working because we are making it so. We means people who come together on Wednesday nights, but it also means all of the people that you will inspire to believe that they have uh, not just a voice, but a role in making it work. So to me, that's what this, this night is about. Um, I will follow your lead and not introduce myself until after I've said a few things. I'm Jan Palka. Um, uh, I've been the founder of Code of America. I recently returned to the organization um, in the role, again, in the role of executive director after having spent a year in federal government, which to me was about really having the experience of working in government because I don't believe that we can 
change a very entrenched system unless we really understand it. Um, I'm delighted to be back. And I'm delighted <laughs> to be working at the local level, and um, delighted to be be able to uh, you know attend events like this, um, and particularly delighted to be um, reconnected with the kinds of work that actually impacts. I, I, I like. I like what you said about, first and foremost, we are people. Um, another way to sort of say our mission statement is government can work for people, by people. It doesn't have to be the people. That's a big, big concept that is infused with a lot of, I don't know, like visions of guys in wigs. Um, but people <laughs> is like user research. It's like the person on the street, you know, who's trying to interact with government services. It's the um, person who's trying to get supplemental nutrition assistance, or the person who's trying to go to City Hall and get, um, well, in our case, currently, a permits for remodeling our kitchen. Like, it's an actual human being with an actual need in a much more concrete way than the notion of the people implies, and we really mean both. We, we really want to talk about both that sort of larger sense of working for the people and just working for actual, real human beings. Um, and I think that's sort of what I was related to some of the topics that, 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 um, that you teased up. But again, I think it's amazing to me how much the um, Hundreds of brigades that get together around the world uh, on a weekly basis will end up replicating somewhat, I mean, somewhat because they're connected to sort of the headquarters here, but really, like, on their own, come to the same language and the same conclusions because they're driven by the same set of values and the same outcomes that they're looking for. That, that you would say that sort of independent of, of re like referencing the mission statement, in the end, it is. Um, this is Tim O'Reilly, who was um, a co-worker, or I guess a colleague of mine when we were working at Web 2.0, and then became the inspiration for Code for America, um, through a story that we can tell later if you like, um, was a founding board member of Code for America, is now also my fiance, um, but has a lot to say about, um, about government as a platform, about Code for America, and particularly about the topic I think we're, we're going to kind of transition to, which is the um, maker movement and its connection to America. All right, let me just say a couple of things. Uh, first off, um, thanks a lot. I, I, I was, uh, I said, Jen, what's this thing on your calendar tonight? And she said, uh, oh, I'm speaking to, to the San Francisco Brigade. And I said, would you like me to come? And she said, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I wasn't sure what to expect. Uh, but hey, this is really wonderful to see you, and what a great, you know, and then I was sort of thinking, you know, my, you know, my business, you know, we work with a lot of user groups, and they usually meet monthly. And I, and I say, well, how often do you guys meet? It's like every week. And I'm like, oh, awesome. You know, that's like, that's serious. Um, and, uh, you know, there's this real organization and, and, and work going on here. It's not just sort of, you know, let's just, so I, I don't really want to keep you from it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, just so sort of just, very briefly, I, I, I don't think I think Jen's formulation of why we do what we do is is so right on, and you know this. So I, I've actually been taking this um, theme. In fact, I've been stealing her slides uh, for thought. I'm going to be a talk at Microsoft that next week, and you know it, it's it's actually about the Internet of Things, and it's, it's called the Internet of Things and Humans. You know, and, and it starts with. You know, Internet of Things applications and how the design of them, get, to get them right, requires thinking about where humans fit in the picture, all the way through to like how when you build web services and the healthcare that got rescued, it's really a story about the rescue was helping humans to work with each other more effectively. And then through to some of the Code for America projects, which are really about doing user experience design so that you build services that work for humans. And this whole arc from the most cutting edge technology through what looked like a technology disaster to, um, you know, kind of how do we rebuild government services? There's this art, which is all about, <clears throat> let's put technology in its rightful place. It's supposed to be helping us build a better society, you know, and, and you know, we have this, we've taken this huge detour 
where, oh, oh, technology, that's a way to get rich. You know, and what's so awesome is like you're here because you think you can make a difference with it. And that's so inspiring. And, and I guess the story that Jen was referring to, uh, I gave a talk in uh, 2008 at a conference called the Emerging Technology Conference. And, and uh, the talk was entitled Why I Love Hackers. And it was really about the idea of people who pursue things for the love of it rather than for money. And uh, just, you know, just look at how much human progress has come when people are, are sort of hacking on stuff, uh, you know, uh, rather than, oh, yeah, I'm an entrepreneur. And we have this whole mythology in Silicon Valley that it all begins with the entrepreneur. And I say, no, no, it all begins with the hacker. And in my career, everything interesting I've seen started with a bunch of people who didn't think there was any, any money in what they were doing yet. They were hacking on it because, you know, there was nothing else. Yeah, you know, it's like you look at the web. Microsoft had it all sewn up. You know, it's like, well, let's go go work on this cool stuff where we can make things and share with other people for free. You know, then the web gets all sewn up. Oh, let's go let's go make stuff. The maker movement starts. You know, it's like nobody thought there was money in it. You know, now of course the VCs are there too, and people are going out hacking on biotech or whatever. You know, because the hacker impulse is is I want to make something. I want to do something. I want to have an impact. And uh, so just that notion that that precedes entrepreneurial. Anyway, Janet looked at me. And, you know, with um, just like she loved this talk. I ended with this, you know, poem of Rilke where he talks about working on stuff that's hard. It's a poem about Jacob wrestling with the angel, not thinking he would actually be able to defeat the angel, but that he gets stronger from trying. And, and the poem ends with this invocation. It goes something like, you know, what we fight with is so small, and when we win, it makes us small. What we want is to be defeated decisively by progressively greater things, you know? And uh, I, I, I love that. Anyway, I was sort of reciting that, and Jen's looking at me, and she, then she comes up to me and she says, I want a talk like that for my conference, but you've got to make pitch it for entrepreneurs and tell them what to do. So that was the beginning of a series of talks that I did for the next couple of years uh, with the title, we'll Work on Stuff That Matters. And then out of that, you know, kind of looking at hackers who were actually starting to work on civic stuff, we launched together this, these Gov2O events in Washington, D.C. And then uh, Jen, who by that time was starting to surpass me in her insight and enthusiasm, said, hey, you know, I think the real opportunity is not in Washington, it's at the local level. And uh, so uh, she, she, she quit working with me to go start Code for America, so then I had to follow her, and now I work for her. <laughs> so, yeah. But inherent in that story is the fact that um, the maker movement and the Gov2O movement were growing up at the same time. And Jesse was um, insightful enough to kind of call that out as a theme that's not just relevant to sort of the history of the movement or even the future of the movement, but to um, it's relevant to sort of attention, right? That is, uh, we're always struggling with when we do civic tech, which is, is it more important to be building something or is it more important to be reusing something? Because there's always something there that's relevant to what you've done. And should you be writing something from the ground up, should you be reusing something? Um, and it, it, I think that's, you know, it, it's so, there are two competing narratives, two competing um, uh, sort of like principles that seem inconsistent within uh, our community. And one is, look, we, the, it, it starts with sort of the dysfunction of the current government tech ecosystem which says, um, we only know how to do one thing, which is to write an, you know, we have a need for um, some sort of, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example, a collaboration platform. We only have one tool in our toolbox, here. we've got a hammer, so everything looks like a nail, and so we're gonna write an RFP, and we're going to spec it out till, you know, the cows come home, and we're gonna end up with a $350 million contract with Beltway Bandit to build something which essentially is Slack or Basecamp, but with like half the functionality, it doesn't actually work, right? So let's, or, you know, we, we as a city government want to um, uh, have a, an application that um, allows us to access, you know, basic data that the, that the city has, you know, and, and for the citizens. So we're, we have to do this ourselves. We have to, Truth of the matter is that application already exists. Let's reuse it. So this intent, this this desire to 
So we're, we're fighting against that. Code Merc was built on the notion that we should be shopping from each other's closets in terms of uh, government technology. We should not be going out there and having everything be custom built at great expense to taxpayers um, because there's no reason to. That's just because you happen to have, again, the only tool in your toolbox is, is an RFP, right, to a certain set of vendors. Um, when in fact we could be we could be sharing so we should be building it. Um, one of the core principles: common ownership, mm -hmm. right? So like we, there should be common ownership of applications. Every city thinks they're individual. Every city thinks that their needs are absolutely unique. They're not, right? <laughs> like every city does the basic core set of functions with with its own flavor. So wh why can't we get to a place? Where there's a common set of basic apps and technology and APIs that are used that are used and reused over and over again, and yet there's this competing vision, which is there's something core to this community that is about making things from scratch, which is about hacking, which is about building, and isn't about reuse. And how do we how do we square that circle? How do we figure out to, how to bring those two? Um, notions together in a way, because they are both valid, they are both authentic, and they are both correct. Well, uh, one thing that occurs to me, if you look at the history of uh, any sort of technology movement, and I think, for example, about the web, uh, you know, reuse is a great way to learn. You know, that's how, you know, certainly in the early days of the web, everybody built a website because they, they went and they looked, they saw some cool new feature, and guess what? It was, was effectively open source, not by license, but by the fact that it was a view source button that you could say, how did they do that? You know, so you copy the you, you know, reuse it. Now we've kind of evolved, we, we have a lot of stuff on GitHub that makes it even easier, and that's all fantastic. You know, so we built this infrastructure for reuse, but a huge part of that reuse is actually, you know, some of it's like you're cobbling something together for, you know, to begin with, some of it's to learn, and once you've learned, then often you'll go and you'll make something new from scratch. And uh, I think that that's, uh, you know, there's a, there's a pretty powerful thing there in, in the maker movement. You know, you look at, uh, as well, you look at how many of the early maker projects were just, we're going to make do, we're going to reuse things. And that was where it really started. All the early projects in Make Magazine were like, okay, here's a guy who made a uh, programmable, you know, uh, cat feeder out of an old VCR. You know, that, that was the story of the second issue of Make. You know, and now you know it's like, hey, there, there's you know, companies like uh, you know 3D Robotics, who you know started out with a, a maker group DIY drones, turned into a business, now has a factory and is making you know equipment that's used in agriculture, and you know, so that's the arc. In the same way that some of those early web people who were just sort of you know learning by doing ended up making companies, and I think in the, in the civic uh, space we're seeing the same arc, starting with. Hey, let's go hack on this. Let's go make something. And then, you know, just like even the Code for America projects, you know, the, the fellows are effectively small startup teams. A whole bunch of them go, "We did a great project. Now we want to turn it into a company." You know, we've now got four or five companies that have come out of fellowship projects. Uh, not to mention a bunch of other, uh, you know, civic startups that are kind of coming into the space. It's actually that same process of people saying, "Let's start with hacking, and then let's start really." Uh, saying now that we figured out what people want, let's you know double down on it. And I think we are seeing a, a big change. One of the changes in government is going to come through, you know, a change in the vendor ecosystem around it. Yeah, I think it's a change in the vendor ecosystem, and it's a change in what we consider to be the core capabilities of governing. So we have lived the past century where if you went into government, you probably had either a law degree, an economics degree, or a communications degree. Those were the skill sets that, that meant that you were good in government. And hello, it's the 21st century. And the way, you know, government is fundamentally about sort of managing processes and including people and delivering services, right? Those things are now fundamentally done through digital means in our society. And yet, we have sort of said, yeah, that thing, that digital world, is something we'll buy. Right? We're still going to hire lawyers and um, uh, communications people and economists to run the government, but we'll have a separate set of people 
who are good at this thing called acquisition, and they'll buy us the technology we need. And to me, that sums up a lot of what's wrong. <laughs> um, and so it's, it, it's a story about saying that the skill of understanding the digital world is fundamental to the business of running government. Government cannot run without a digital skill set. So, you know, number one is one of the reasons we have to hack on things. So this is a this is sort of a, we will I will hear like the, like the pro and the con. Like I'll debate myself <laughs> on this topic, but like for the pro of like we have to hack on things, we have to build stuff from scratch is we need people who are builders, whether it's digital or not, but fundamentally tinkers, builders, makers in government, because that is 21st century government, right? It is about service delivery and through digital. It happens to be that we are going to deliver services to citizens through digital means in the 21st century. There's no way around it. That's not an argument about the digital divide. I completely believe that we need to d deliver services to citizens in a way that works for them. Um, but there isn't a world in which delivery of service, delivery of service to citizens, even those who don't have access to technology, doesn't have some incredibly you know, important technology back end to it, right? So there's just no way we skirt that. Um, we have to have that capability in house. So we've got to be able to tink we've got to give room for people to tinker with things and create things because we need to bring that skill set into government. And we've got to get away from the notion. Um, that digital is something we buy. Um, Mike Bracken, who runs the GDS in London, the Government Digital Service. Anybody here heard of the Government Digital Service in London? Not bad. Um, so this is this is a group in central government in the UK that has sort of taken over the way that they spend money in digital and said, we're going to do this driven by user needs. But he has a line, says, procurement is for pencils. And our version of that is, Digital isn't something you uh, isn't something you buy. It's something you do. Uh, and Jesse has to talk a little bit about this digital front door project, which I'm not the best person to talk about, but I'll do my best job on it. Um, if you're if you're a city government, pretty private innovate. Let's let's distinguish between innovation innovation and the basics, right? Innovation is let's figure out all the cool new things we can do. The basics is like. Do we have a website that works for citizens? Like, can people come to our website and do what they showed up to do? Um, well, the We've way... We've all gone to government websites yes. and gone around in little circles. Yeah. yeah, has anyone here gone to a government website and been, like, thrilled with what they... <laughs> so, I went to the chief, uh, or the data, uh, what is it, Joy? Data... Yeah. Data SF. Um, Hi, Joy! <laughs> and uh, it happens to be pretty cool to, well, for, is, for a government website. But you know? it's a disaster for like four people. Exactly, <laughs> and that's the point. We are making huge yeah. progress. And I think one of the things that I find in, in, in fascinating in technology is you look at it, and it looks like it's going nowhere, and then bang. You know, we've all seen those hockey yeah. stick graphs, and that's not just about adoption of Facebook or something mm -hmm. going viral. It's also like an idea like, yeah, we do enough good government websites, and all the people who have crappy ones are going to look around and go, "Whoa, whoa, I got to be like them," you know. And so there's a tipping point here that we're working towards. Yeah, but but, but this notion that uh, whether it's a website or some other digital service that connects citizens with their government is something that you can that you cannot just go procure and, and then like, oh good, it's done. And it's gonna sit here. Oh, and we'll bring we'll in, 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 in we're on some sort of schedule. So like six years from now we'll be able to buy another one. And we'll do it again. But rather there is someone in charge like Joy is of the uh, of, of San Francisco's data and the, the connection that we have to that data of constantly going, what do people need? How is this getting better and more relevant to them every single day in some small way? is a completely radical notion, right? So you cannot buy those things. And if you fundamentally believe that, then you are going to have to be tinkering every single day, right? You are going to have to say, um, at, you know, as Google and Apple run dozens of experiments on their platform every single day to figure out what, how can we make this a little bit better, a little bit better? If we do start to do that in government, yeah, we are fundamentally tinkerers. 
we're fundamentally experimenting, playing, trying, and it gets back to your notion of it's it's about playing around your your thing about it's, it's forget about the VCs. Where are people playing? Where are people experimenting? Where are people having fun? It's that spirit that we want to bring in here. Yeah. So, so the hardware, you were gonna bring up hardware, yeah, right? absolutely. So I'm gonna ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't quite gonna bring up hardware. But I would love to dive into hardware. I don't know. Go ask your other question then. Ask hardware. <laughs> so, um, one of the things that, that a lot of people want to know is when all these digital services come into government, uh, you know, whether they're purchased or tinkered with or hacked together or uh, produced by a brigade, perhaps, uh, what happens to those jobs, right? So, so I, I get the question when. We eliminate 18 processes for, or 18 steps from this building oh, permitting I process. I have a good answer for that. Awesome. So I'll finish the question and then, and then just so for people. Uh, uh, when, when we eliminate 18 steps from this process of, of producing a building permit and it gets down to two and then you don't need three people anymore, what do we do with them? Do we re educate them and get them to tinker with that process to, to do user research essentially? To, to Say, hey, wow! How could we make this process even better? Or maybe they do something. I mean, I'm looking forward to this. This is great. So uh, let me just sort of say, I, I started this back in the very beginning of when I was doing these conferences in DC. I said I actually don't want necessarily to shrink the size of the government ecosystem. I don't want to shrink the size of the government. I just want to make it do what we're paying it to do. You know what I mean? When you talk about taking 18 steps out of the business planning process, yeah. How about giving us a permit? without having to wait for three years. You know, it's sort of like, it's not like there's not a backlog of work. You know, my daughter just applied for a permit. It took three years to get a permit, you know, to tear down a, a tear, anybody can look at it. You know. So, so the, 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 there's so much that needs doing. And, and this is not just true in government, but I, I'm in all these uh, meetings outside of the Churchill Club thing with all these economists, and they're talking about the lack of jobs, and the robots are eating all our jobs, and, you know, oh my God, you know, the, the, you know, America's in for trouble. And I look around and go, wait a minute, does anybody think there's not work to be done? Stop talking about jobs. Start talking about things that need doing. If you focus on that, you the jobs will come. It's like, you know, you know, we, we have to fix our infrastructure, we have to change our whole energy mix, we have to feed the world, we have to take care of aging, an aging population, we have to educate our kids. We're not doing any of these things well. So all of this stuff, just do it better. There's plenty of capacity that we to soak up stuff that needs doing, you know, without worrying about, oh, well, well it's just, you know, we'll just be more efficient. We can cut some jobs and continue to provide shitty service. You know, it's like, no, take on more, take on more. You know, everybody in government is there going, we need more resources to do what we do. I mean, I, everybody in government, you've got the people who say, well, we just need to shrink government. But I look at this, I go, if we do this right, we actually get more, you know, we actually uh, satisfy both conservatives and liberals because the conservatives go, wow, we've actually got a government that's efficient. You know, the liberals can say, actually, yeah, we're actually delivering the services that we, we're, we're trying to do. We're, we're solving the problems that we're trying to solve. And so I look at that and I go, there's a real win to be had by making all this stuff actually work. Because then we can, you know, take all this resource that we're putting towards hard problems, and we'll either actually be solving those problems, or if we free up that resource, we go, oh, what else haven't we gotten to? You know, because you know, one of the things about government that people forget, it's one of our original means of collective action. You know, we got together, and we said, uh, you know, throughout history. People have gotten together and said, we have to have a mechanism for doing all the things that none of us will do individually. And, you know, it's like, so we have, that, now we see government as the obstacle. Let's get back to seeing government as something that works for us. That's why I love Jen's formulation of the Code of America, you know, uh, mission statement, you know, government, which of course is, a, as you know, a restatement of the Gettysburg Address, government by the people, for the people, uh, actually, that's also of the people. We, 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 <laughs> we talk about that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, how wonderful is that? It's like us working together to solve hard problems. It's like, that 
that's a pretty wonderful mission statement, not just for government, but for any company, for any society. So, so like, stop thinking about, well, you know, there's not going to be enough work to go around, you know, because last time I looked around, we weren't living in a perfect world, and there's still a hell of a lot of stuff to do. Can I give a little bit of... Sorry, I kind of... Yeah, totally. I'll try to be brief, but... Um, um, I'll give an example from my work in federal government for the year. Um, one of the things I did was I was asked to go work with um, the United States Citizenship and Immigration, um, part of the Department of Homeland Security, after the healthcare and death failure, because it was clear to the administration that if we were that vulnerable on the president's current, you know, policy priority of, of the um, Affordable Care Act, we were probably vulnerable in implementation of things like immigration reform. In other words, if you can spend all that time on getting the ACA passed and yet it fails in implementation, is that also true of immigration reform, basically? So I, I went and spent a lot of time over at USCIS, and one of the things I did is brought in a couple guys um, from Silicon Valley tech companies to come in and do a consult with us over the course of a week and a half. And, you know, what, what the mindset in government was okay, these Silicon Valley guys are going to tell us the, like, seven tech things we need to do. We need, like, different servers, and we need, like, you know. And they did. They had. They said, at the, end of the, at the end of the week and a half, they said, yes, we have a fair number of things that we would advise you to do technologically in terms of this particular program that we've been asked to, to do a consult on. None of them will matter because you are not organizationally set up <laughs> to um, have what we would call in Silicon Valley product manager. Basically someone who's responsible for looking at the outcomes of that um, program on a daily, weekly, momentarily, whatever, like basis, and say, here's the experiment we're gonna run to figure out if this is gonna get better. Here are the results we got from that experiment, so we're implementing that or we're not implementing it. That, that notion of continually working on something to make it better, um, doesn't exist. They don't have a team of people in a, what we would think of here as a product manageable. They have IT people and they have business people and the business people come up with ideas and they throw them over the wall to the IT people. Well, they have and the IT people, they're, they're policy people. Well, yeah. they're, <laughs> we can have that debate. But there is an, so like that conversation isn't about you. Um, need to get rid of people. It's you need to redeploy people to be, as one of our capabilities says, organized around outcomes. And there is so much work the government has to do that it's just about retaking staff that are currently focused on compliance with a wide variety of different processes and requirements, and move them towards being focused on outcomes and be focused again to return. I will beat this drum, I will beat this horse until it's dead on the needs of actual people, right? A product manager's role is to understand the people who are using the service and whether they're getting the, uh, the desired result from using that service. If you can basically take vast swaths of government's, uh, government, you know, public servants, who by the way are amazing people and do genuinely pretty much all of them care about the people and the outcomes and say, your job now is to make sure that the people you're trying to serve are getting the service that you have said you would. That is a very, that, that needs to happen en masse and it's redeployment, not getting rid of people. Um, your time's up. Oh, we've done it. We do talk about hardware. Right. <laughs> so, um, but, we, but, but we care more about you guys hacking then we care about lame, uh, you know, quantification from here. So we better get to that. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, with that, I kind of want to do maybe one, two questions from the audience. Uh, I can have two guys. Yeah, like one. Um, audience questions. Yeah, I'm curious. How has the kind of emergence of ATF in the U.S. digital service kind of changed the game for people in America? Um, I'll try to be brief on that. That um, my 18 f friends were here earlier today. Um, uh, delivery. What is 18 f for, sir? 18 uh, f and USDS combined, and my my math is 18 f plus USDS equals government digital service in the UK, but the American version. Um, 
18F is the delivery arm, USDS is strategy and oversight. In the, US, in the UK, they're able to locate those two, or those three functions in one place. In the US government, that's really hard, so we put them in two different places. But fundamentally, it's about a shift from an obsession with policy, where you write policy once and then it just runs sort of you know, uncontrolled, to a focus on delivery and constantly delivering such that you can have a feedback loop to your policy. Your policy then becomes subservient to your user need, your delivery of the user need. To me, it's about um, fundamentally focusing on the delivery of digital services to citizens and making that a priority. Like the fact that, that USDS is at the White House level and, you, and 18F is, is closely connected to that means that you finally have people at the highest level in government going, I get it, we should shut up about policy and actually deliver. So, and obviously, Code for America is working that same game plan on the local level. And it makes sense that they're singing the same tune because certain people were involved in both efforts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we actually have a brigade member who is uh, to be employed by 18F. I won't sing them out, but. Uh, we're 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 awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's uh, very cool. And uh, we hope to be doing some coordination at some point. Uh, another, another question. Yeah. Um, so in terms, I really like to point on hacking, the mentality of hacking in terms of governance, and the governance will focus on delivery as, as the final product rather than the whole eight six step process. So my question is, how is the hacking mentality perhaps addressing product management? Because open source developers often have already in their mind and they need to find project from time to time. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? I'm sorry, product management on one side, sort of hacking on the other? Uh, I, I can take a stab at that. I think, uh, first, so if a hacker is uh, their own product manager, right? You know, you kind of have an idea of something that you're trying to do for yourself, for your friends, for people you know. Um, once you graduate to having to work in an organization, uh, and you're working on, on a bigger you know, project that involves a lot of people, a lot of stakeholders. Uh, you know, the product manager is somebody who sits there and is, is really, I think, the, you know, the, the person who helps make it all come together. Uh, I, I think you know, if, if you get to a, a sufficiently, you know, if you get if you if you get to a sufficiently large scale, you know, you can't just do it all in ad, ad hoc. Or and, and I think there's also probably a, a, a division between projects that are more suited for hacking because they're, they're early stage versus, hey, we're really trying to bring this out you know, to end consumers. Um, so I'd like to take a poll. <laughs> it's 7.30. Um, I am completely fascinated by the conversation. There may be some people who here who want to hack tonight. Um, if you want to hack, you are free to uh, leave the room at any time. Do not feel obligated to stay seated if you need to get stuff done. Uh, we will but, not be offended. We will be impressed. <laughs> right. uh, if you would like to continue this conversation, uh, uh, Jen and Tim have graciously offered to stay another 15 minutes or so. Uh, and <laughs> And so, uh, so we can we can do that. So uh, perhaps we can take another couple more questions. Uh, Joseph, hi. Uh, this question is for Tim. Uh, so, uh, as a brigade, I recently launched this service called Local Free Web, where the way it works is you go to bus stops in San Francisco and you text a bus stop ID, and it returns to them the three closest locations where they can get access to the internet. So, in your talk, you mentioned uh, we need to deliver services to citizens. Them. Uh, in your situation, our target audience most likely has no internet access, so we can't reach them with the, I guess, traditional means that this technology made you, such as Twitter, Facebook, social media. So, do you have any experience in reaching out to those types of individuals who don't make internet approachable? Um, a awesome project. How am I finding out about this through like a question? <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so I just want to caveat what I'm going to say, but the fact that um, I often speak for others, I personally have no experience with that. But um, 
I vicariously do. Um, we have, whenever we send fellows into the city, um, they're dealing with the fact that they're trying to serve everyone, right? Like the difference between serving, the difference between a consumer internet startup and government is like your audience, your, your, your customer base is everyone. And a lot of times that means that you're talking about people who don't have internet access or don't, maybe don't have internet smart, smart. Increasingly that's covered by smartphone, but it isn't always. So, you know, the, I think the, the place where we first really grappled with that was in Philadelphia. We worked with Philadelphia in the first and second years of Coke America through the fellowship program. Um, and particularly, is anyone from Texas in here? I saw Eddie earlier, his colleague of theirs. Um, uh, the, the, the problem that, they, that the city of Philly presented to the fellows that year was we're going into a strategic planning process or Philadelphia 2035 plan. And we ask people, the only way we ask people to come be engaged is by actually literally coming to City Hall. I think it was like Thursdays at 6.30 and there's maps on the wall and you can mark it up and you can give your input. Well, yes, I understand that that breaks the digital divide because anybody can walk in, but it doesn't break class divides or even divides of like between people who have kids who don't. I mean, there's just a lot of people who can't show up at 6.30 on Thursday, but there's also not... The, the, the people that would want to engage on the 2035 plan are not exclusively people with iPhone or Android phones, right? Or people with uh, internet at home. And so they also chose to use text messaging because they looked at the numbers and they said, I think it was something like only 60% of homes in Philadelphia had internet access. But if you took, you know, smartphones and feature phones, you know, you, ha you got to 97% of the population. And they put up, they used posters to get the word out. It was, and we talked about brigades being hyperlocal. This was so hyperlocal. It was like, we want feedback about this bus stop, and we have a poster on this bus shelter about whether this um, bus line should be extended. Text your feedback. Um, and, and yeah, so te I mean, currently, text messaging is the way, really, that through digital means, we reach everyone. And I, that's just an awesome project. I'm glad you're going to be doing it. Yeah. Uh, can I add a little bit? that which is um, um, you know there have been some successful campaigns around stuff like that using you know, public service announcements you know, which are radio stations for example are obliged to, to do um, you know I, I, I think you know it, it is a bit of a challenge because you know it's it's, it's you know it's like it's not the hot button topic you don't have the ice bucket challenge <laughs> you need to uh, expect but, a challenge by text. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that, you know, there are probably some traditional means of publicity. But the other thing would be just to kind of go, okay, where are the, uh, where are the, your target audience? Where do they gather? Uh, I heard about a, a program in uh, New York. I, I don't even remember the details of the program, but they basically, it was, it was some kind of service to help people sign up for social services. They said, where, where, where are we likely to find the people? Oh, at food banks. You know, so they basically, uh, this this uh, nonprofit just literally, uh, you know, said to food banks, you know, we'll give you a spiff if you sign people up. You know, and they were like, oh great, we'll have a table with all the food banks. You know, so maybe some things like that where you kind of go, where would the people who are my target audience likely to be, and then go out and see if we can partner with them to help publicize it for you. Okay. So thank thank you. You. Um, I'm going to take moderator's preference for one question. Uh, we're talking about the <laughs> uh, we're talking about the way to access people who may not uh, access things in the way many of us do via smartphones, via the internet. Uh, however, many of those people are still hacking on something, and they're tinkering with something, and they're building something. And so, I'm wondering how you. Uh, how can we find them? How can we bring them in? How can we include these people who already have this instinct that they need to fuss with their things or their whatevers in order to make them work for them or be better in some way, improved? How can we bring them in uh, and, and nurture that, that instinct? Such a good question. <laughs> I mean, any, I mean the, the truth is that almost everybody who's dealing with um, an interface that's fundamentally not working for them is hacking it to get their needs met. Mm -hmm. 
um, that's a yeah, we might call it a workaround. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, a member of Facts of Philly, is here working in Philly, Jeff Friedman, there, this is where Max Shear said, you've got to understand that anything that works in government is a hack. Everything that actually works is a workaround in some way, which is less and less true, as I'm happy to say, but, but we felt that it was true at the time. But, but I think your question is about inclusiveness, right? It's about right. saying, mm -hmm. if you are a victim, it's not a, if, you, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the system is not serving you, but you're successfully getting what you need, you're probably hacking it, therefore you are part of our, you're part of our movement. You are the we that is making government work. Right? Mm -hmm. And how can I find you and, yeah. and support you in that effort? I think that's a question for everyone in the audience. Audience, does anyone have any <laughs> thoughts? How can, I, how can I find you and support you? Do we have to have uh, uh, Jen and Tim speak regularly for you to come here? <laughs> um, <laughs> there you go. Anyone? Yeah. I have a question about, um, at least we were alluded to revamping the RFP or procurement process in government. Um, I worked in government for five years, and I was curious, how did you manage, or how did anyone um, making that change manage to influence stakeholders and directors and bureaucrats and process holders that these things need to change, that the status quo um, really is not cut it? Well, I think um, the good news there is that like, you know, they say never bet against the internet. Like, we, I mean, the, um, the need to meet um, citizens' expectations isn't going to go away, and their expectations are going to increase every every guy at this point every day, right? Like, because the apps on our phone get better every single day. Dude, I just used Uber Pool for the first time, by the way. Like, like somehow magically now I can actually pay less for an Uber because I'm going to share it with someone else. Like, these features will disappear and they won't. Government's going to have to meet that bar. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that's the good news. But I mean, but, but tactically for us, um, the specific thing you're asking about is, I think, our engagement with the city of Oakland. I'm not the best person to talk about it, but um, there's sort of a process, right? The first thing is that people in city government began to believe that something else was possible, right? They, they saw that there was a way of doing things that was fundamentally different from the way they're doing it, and, and that it had an outcome that was meaningful to them and to the people of Oakland. Was that by example? Was that something had happened, and they said, wow, that's a fantastic example. I can relate to that. There's a story around that. that yeah, I, can... I, I think we started, you know, when I first started my open government activism, it was around um, the notion that, hey, look, this thing is happening in the private sector. Uh, you know, government shouldn't be left behind. And, but then once we started going working it, we went and found all these great government stories. And then it was like, hey, look, so and so is doing this great thing. So -and, -so, and, and you start celebrating people. You know, and it's sort of like that's how we did it when I was doing my original open source activism or web 2.0. These were all things where you find people who are doing something yeah. great and you tell their story and you start saying, hey, these people go together. You know, and and that's really you know, what we've been trying to do, is to really make a movement simply by showing off the people who, who are doing exceptional work, and then that becomes the expectation. Everybody else wants to be there. I sometimes refer to it as the Be Like Mike strategy, you know, and kind of like that Nike advertising campaign. It's like you just find you know, the Michael Jordans of government, and you say, hey, look, look what they're doing. You know? and, and everybody goes, yeah, I want to be like Mike. But there was a fundamental thing I think that happened in Oakland, which because I do think that works sort of universally, yeah, yeah. which is let's make sure the spotlight is on these guys that they are being recognized yeah. for the work that they've done. But what I heard from the staff in Oakland, so they became interested through seeing a bunch of applications that had happened before and said, okay, that's something that makes sense. They applied to the fellowship. We did a fellowship program with them last year. Um, a team of great fellows worked on the records request issue. They built something called Record Track. And um, the outcome was great. So record track actually works. It's a much, much better way for you to request a, uh, you know, a record from the city of Oakland and then it gets served back up in a way that everyone can see it. it that's all great. It's fantastic. It works. But the point is that is an, is an ident like I think from the city government, what, what, from the perspective of city government people, and you obviously are already that person, but for a lot of people, it's an identity issue 
where they went from going like, we are not one of the cool kids. We work in government, so we don't do things that way. We don't do things iteratively fast in a user-centered way that fundamentally, you know, it, um, well, it's fundamentally different from what we're doing it now. They went through the process with the fellows, and they came up with this outcome. And the real outcome is they go, we actually can do that. We are cool kids. We can do this that way. And now we want to do other things that way. And so let's do more of that because it's, it's now core to our identity that we are capable, we in city government in Oakland are capable of that kind of outcome. And we want to keep doing it. And then you get demand for, yes, so if that means we have to do our RFPs differently, fine, let's go figure out how to do it. If that means we have to uh, approach vendors differently, great, let's go do that. If that means we have to approach user research differently, fine. Because that's who we are and that's what we're going to be. That's what they say. Um, I think. Well, I'd, I'd like to answer Jesse's question. Oh, <laughs> 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 So uh, I think the first step would be for us to market in a non-digital fashion. Um, you know, I think we should go out in the community and talk to people and, as Tim pointed out, like meet them at places where they gather um, for their needs to be serviced. So food banks or rallies or people who care. So I think just going out in the community and reaching out to them is a really good step to find those people. Yeah, walk us on, walk us on. And we've got questions up all on Main Street for mm -hmm. our, one of our good stamp things. We'll tear, I mean, it's very old school, yeah. right? It's posters with a little tear off thing. And they, you, immediately you see the little things are all torn off. Yeah, and it's, there's a trick to tear off one first, right? So you, I didn't know that. <laughs> to get the purchase. Yeah, because that means someone has thought that this is useful. And so, oh, it's someone. The in the, in the seating the tip jar. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. seating the tip jar. Um, did you have a... No, that's it. Okay. There's a lot of science behind it, by the way. Pardon? There's a lot of science behind seeding the tips, right? There are a lot of studies on what amount of dollar bill you should put in order for you to get that time. So 50, right? Yeah. Five bucks. <laughs> if you put over five bucks, you, nobody tips. If you put like five or you know, ones, it kind of, what you put is what you get, mm -hmm. but there's a limit to beyond which point you stop getting, period. Mm -hmm. So it's around five bucks. If you put, that's where you get more. If you put a lot of ones, you get more ones. So beyond five to ten, there's different venues, it kind of starts to decline. Or go to zero. So that's our 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jen Paul and Tim O'Reilly, thank you one more time. At this point, wait, 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 there's more stuff. <laughs> so at this point, hacking. yes, at this point there's hacking. Um, at this point, Preston is going to make a brief announcement about a discotheque, which is pretty flipping cool. And um, this will turn on in just a sec. And uh, it is honestly.